All right, good afternoon. Welcome to our study this afternoon. Look forward to it. Um, it's been quite interesting, some theological things we're going to talk about. But we're going to pray and thank the Lord for this time as always. Father, we approach your throne of grace with thanksgiving and praise in our hearts. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of salvation. We thank you, Lord, that as your people, we can gather and fellowship together and also fellowship around your word. We pray a blessing, Lord, upon everything that's going to be said today. We pray that you'll speak to our hearts, help us to hear, and help us, Lord, to allow your word to mold and shape our thinking. So we come before you, committing ourselves to you, Lord, and thanking you for this time together. In your wonderful name, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 Okay. So, so as I said this, this afternoon, we are going to look at a very important uh, passage. And then, of course, next week, what I'd like to do is, uh, for those who are here with us, we'll do some Q&A on, 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 the, on the subject, on the topic. Um, so I'm going to ask you just to, to listen. And if you have a basic question, we can deal with it. But we don't want to get into theological views and distract from the text and what I want to share with you. Because there are different views on this text. I, I really appreciate that. But I want to share this. You think about it. If you disagree, that's fine. Come back next week and, and you can raise it with me and we can then have a session that we can deal with, with Q&A on this. All right, before we get sort of emotional about it, uh, listen. Listen to what I'm saying this afternoon. Because I just highlight the fact that this morning I was walking and listening to my YouTube as I do. And I'm walking going to, to a coffee shop to prepare my sermon for Sunday. And I listened to a talk. And the guy basically corrected a lot of things I said. I was like, took it very personally when I was talking. I was angry with him on the YouTube talk. Um, and he was correct. Because what I want to look at is it's a key thing. Um, also, one of... Uh, my favorite theologian, Sir Robert Anderson, often mm. speaks about the two types of languages we use. We use language of theology, which is stuff we've been taught as kids yeah. or as, as being in church. It's, 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 we, we regurgitate something I've heard with actually not really realizing it is biblical. It's just something the minister said, the Sunday school teachers said, mm. Christianity says. We just echo that without actually looking at the merits of it biblically. And then you have the language of scripture. And that is important. How does the Bible use a word? How does the Bible use an English word? How does the Bible use it within its context? What is the historical framework of how that word is used? And what we want to do as Christians is deal with biblical language instead of just regurgitating certain theological thoughts. That's very, very important. Secondly, as well, what we deal with today and what we look, look ahead at as we deal with, with the subject is it's not a salvation issue. Because what happens is we've got two things here. You've got the fact that God saves, and then you've got the issue of spiritual growth. If someone doesn't understand the fullness of the cross or the fullness of the theological implications of the cross, they can still be saved. That's not the issue. The issue is for us to understand the depths and how we then share that. Because the enemy of our souls, what he has done is he, he has cause the, the body of Christ to struggle with false teaching, and then it affects the gospel we share. Mm. So not about the salvation issue, but about how the body of Christ then functions within this world, which is for God's honor and glory. If the enemy comes in and false teachers comes in, as, 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 as the Lord even said in his own ministry will come, what happens is it, it, it causes the body of Christ to not be the, the, the body that God wants it to be. Ultimately, his purpose will be fulfilled, but there will be a collateral damage in the individual lives of believers. And that's the danger. Same with sin. God basically is with us and he's, he's always there and, and he forgives us. But sin has consequences. And the same as a lack of spiritual growth has consequences in the life of a believer. In how we live, what we share, how we function. And that is why the church has spent much of its time to try and morally improve people, which is not the call of the church, it is to have a greater and deeper understanding of who the Lord Jesus Christ is, his work, his past work, his present work, his future work. That is what will bring about spiritual growth and then the outworking of, of the fruits of the Spirit and a, a more godly life, not by just trying to make people moral. And that's unfortunately where the church has, has suffered in many, many ways. So let's look at this text. So we're going to read 
1 Timothy 2, 1 to 7. So this is going to be controversial. We know that issue. Not even to talk about the last bit about this, this chapter. Once we get into women in ministry, it's just people going to lose their minds. <laughs> All right. So I'm just preparing myself to deal with this topic and then have to worry about um, sort of the suffragette movement outside the church when we sort of deal with the next part of the chapter. Uh, but let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 7. And as I said, what happens is we've been taught certain things. We have very strong views on certain things. But I want to, us to look at certain theological principles today and then work on it from there. So 1 Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 1 to 7. Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle, I'm speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. As we look at verse 1, we're just going to look at, at the verses. And I have something I want to share at the end um, to really deal with this. It might, might bring it into the, into the middle part as well. And what I find very interesting in verse 1 is that Paul encourages Timothy that the church himself and the church that he's leading that they pray, and they pray for all men. Now, this is quite interesting. Because if you look back in history, whether that is the Puritans or slightly more recent, the Brethren, who were very separationist in their mindset. Mm -hmm. Now, we understand that 500 years ago, you had a lot of issues. You had to have the Huguenots who lead, left, left France. You had quite a few Protestants that left the mm -hmm. Netherlands. You have, of course, the Puritans that had to leave here because of persecution, all this dynamic. And there was it's always been a strained relationship historically between the church and the state and how that works. And especially with COVID, a lot of us have yes. had very strong views on that whole dynamic, which is not what we want to specifically get into, into the dynamics. But we have to acknowledge that there has been for 500 years a very difficult relationship. Mm -hmm. England's been the bastion in the fact that England in Europe yeah. did not go Catholic. And therefore, it, it was basically God used England as a sort of um, lighthouse, really, where there was a lot more freedom for the gospel than places like Spain and France and these type of things. So, so we understand that. But here, 2,000 years ago, we're not dealing now with the the kings and, and, and sort of Europe's issues when it comes to Catholicism, the Protestant church, we're dealing here with Rome 2000 years ago. And those authorities were the Jewish authorities or even the Roman authorities. And here Paul is encouraging Timothy that the church prays for all men, but it's not just prayer. Look at the words that he used. It's not just, not just say, just pray for them. It says here that it's not just general prayers in the notes. But supplication, now, supplication is a very strong word. It comes from the Greek word to, to lack. That the world is in need and we as the church pray for a world that is in need. So here already you don't have this us and them mindset. We are the church. We're going to withdraw ourselves. We're not worried about the world. He's encouraging Timothy and the Ephesian church to pray with supplication for people. To pray for a world that is in need, a world that is lost. And this is a key thought throughout the prayers that Paul prays in the New Testament. He prays for the salvation of souls. And again, I find this odd. What I find odd is, again, biblically, I want to look at biblical language. Because there's Sin separates man from God. We understand that. But I, I find it very strange that the church today, wants to, because we are upset with 
the homosexuals and the adulterers and the children and the murderers and the stuff. The church has created this attitude that the world is our enemy and that God is angry at the world. Now, in, in one sense, that's true, but in another sense, it's not true. Because what separates man from God is sin. God is angry at sin, mm -hmm. but people are still his creation. And there's this funny, there's a funny dynamic that's been planted. That we're basically going to gather at a big conference, and what we're going to do is to tell everyone how bad the world is, and we need to start killing the gays and start killing these people, and that we are just coming out here to destroy people. And that is, I just don't see that biblically. What I see in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is that Christ has come to reconcile the world to the Father. So it's funny that we start having, we are sinners. Bear with me again. We are sinners. I am no better than someone living in Soho. Mm. But I'm the one that's angrier at them than a holy, righteous God that's above me. That I feel I'm responsible for going out and trying to be the judge, jury, and executioner. And yet a holy God that I'm not worthy of even coming before, worthy, a holy God that I'm not even worthy to enter heaven. Me, I'm stronger on the issue than God is. That's what I find funny. Because almost because what I see here in the first verse is that supplication is made for the world. There's a responsibility we have toward the world. And not just supplication, but intercession. It says prayers. And intercession, my intercession, the word there in the Greek is about intimately being concerned. There's an intimacy that if you intercede for someone, you are speaking to God on their behalf in an intimate way. So toward the world, there is supplication because we understand that they are in need. There is also intercession where intimately we come before the Lord pleading their case. Lord, please intervene and say and then also of giving of thanks be made for all men. Thanks for what? Thanks for God's common grace. Thanks for the fact that although people are sinners, they can do some good things. I always say this to people generally that when I do a talk to, to an, a non-Christian audience, whether it's children or whatever, I basically say there are two views that you have. Either the world is good and it sometimes does bad things, or the world is evil with the potential to do good. And I, of course, believe in the latter. That we're all sinners, but we have the potential to still do good. Why? Because the image of God is not completely wiped out of us. We still have part of the image of God. We have the potential to love, to nurture, to care, to be creative, to do good things. But that doesn't negate the fact that we are sinners. And so here, Paul is encouraged to have a very different view, not of the structures of this world, that's the second verse we're going to deal with, but toward the people in the street. And it's very different from what God gave to Israel within its walls. Because again, Israel was a conduit that needed to be kept pure, that was going to birth the Messiah. So certain things were not permitted within the walls of Israel to protect it and keep it from decay and destruction. And certain things within the church are important to keep it from decay and destruction. But it's not the same attitude toward the world. We don't impose certain dynamics. And that's what I find interesting about the law discussion. Because when people are saying we have to go tell the world they've broken God's law, they don't know the law. What law have they broken? What they've broken is the first two commands. That's what the Gentiles have broken. And that is they haven't worshipped God and they've made idols. But to then start talking to them about adultery and start talking to them about lying and murdering and respecting their parents. What? They don't get that. You get that when you understand who God is. But according to Romans 1, what the key law is that the world has broken, they haven't worshipped God, they've rejected him, and they've made other things to worship, and therefore are in a state of rebellion. Rather than coming with all this moral mumbo-jumbo about how people have, you know, 
you haven't really treated your wife in a certain way, your husband in a certain way. So, you know, you've really sinned before a holy God. And the guy's like, have you met my wife? <laughs> you know, we, 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 again, we, we Christianize these little talk to make it so cute, but it makes absolutely no sense for the pagans. So I'm just using that. So it's, it's a key thought to me for us to think about, not to always just want to take a flamethrower to people. I'm not saying we mustn't speak about sin and deal with it. We have to. But remember what we're fighting against. We're not fighting against flesh and blood. We are fighting against principalities and powers in heavenly places. Mm. So what people are doing, the motivation behind it is not always just from them. Yes, it is the rebellious, sinful heart. But there's, an, there's, an, there's, a, there's a wicked force behind a lot of what's happening. And then uh, verse 2 says, then for both kings, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in, in, in all godliness and reverence. So we mustn't just pray for just people in the street. But we must also pray for those in authority. Now, this is important because, again, especially from my perspective, I speak from me, I've got a big issue with what's happening with government. I get it. Mm. But also, my, my son has been watching this. Uh, it's quite a good, it's called Yippie. It's a Christian children's uh, channel where you can find good Christian, um, uh, you know, sort of cartoons and things about the Bible stories. I loved it. It's really great. And one was about Daniel. And then you had um, sort of uh, Darius and Cyrus. I don't know, Darius, Cyrus, I think Cyrus. Cyrus was there. Now, Cyrus is a Persian king. And I just said to Harry, you know, because you've got Dan, Daniel being thrown into the lion's den. And you got this, this Persian king. And I just had to say to Harry, remember that this Persian king's grandson was actually the one who then built the Jewish temple. Mm. That God can use those in authority to do certain good things without us being naive. Mm. And so well, the prayers must be that God will raise our people to do certain good things. And again, it might only be within a generation. It might only be within a a term that a prime minister might have or a president, which basically is four years. Four years is nothing, by the way. Uh, please join us on Sunday when I start dealing with unveiling the mystery. You start dealing with things in Acts where it's 10 years have gone by. Mm. Four years biblically is nothing. To you, it might feel like an eternity. But four years is nothing. So God could raise up a godly person for a short period of time because that's his purpose. So we pray for the freedom for the church to function, for the freedom to be able to worship and do what God's called us to do. So that's also part here of that in verse 2, that we pray. And what are we praying for? We're not praying for the salvation of a prime minister. We're not praying for revival within the cabinet. I mean, that's just nonsense. But what you're praying for is that we all can live a peaceable life in godliness and reverence so that we have the freedom mm. and the peace to worship. And do the work of the ministry. That's all we're asking for. So again, it's a funny mindset. We're going to have like you know prayer meetings for weeks on end to basically pray a Christian into 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 the into the government. That is just not what, what Paul is saying. He's not praying that Caesar becomes this wonderful Christian. He's not dealing with that. He's just asking that we from all government levels that we can just worship in peace. That's the key that we all want. And then we want to verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. It's God's will that we do this. And that's why it's very interesting about the Christian's role within, to function within society, how that looks. And again, the issue is when you look at the book of Daniel, it's a beautiful picture. The book of Daniel, Daniel was always respectful. He was always a person that would speak highly of those of authority in a respectful manner, but never ever was he willing to bow down it's a very it's a beautiful picture i'm not eating your foods and i'm not worshiping your gods but i will function within the society and do the best i can but i'm not going to do that and that was the problem for us during the covid situation was the fact that you know it, it wasn't just about whatever your view is around covid it was the issue was now people are encroaching on the, our mm. ability to worship yeah. and if we look back now, I know this for a fact. I said this at the time, not because I'm a prophet, because I know human beings. I said this is going to cause a big problem for the church. And we look back now, and many churches have lost people, and people don't go to church anymore. 
it has decimated the in the UK church, unfortunately, doesn't have the luxury of losing 20 people. We don't have it. You have that in America, you can lose 20, you, you gain 40. But in the UK, we can't afford that because people already are in a difficult space. So we've seen what, what, it's, what it's done. And now this when we get to verse four, five, and six and seven, when we get to this whole issue, as I said. Just, I'm just going to talk. Let me talk. Next week, you can come with some questions. Okay. So what is God's desire? God's desire is that all men be saved. So pray for the world. Pray for those in authority. This is God's will. Because his desire is that all men will be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, that's a very, very strong statement, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And this is now where we get to the issue again of, 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 of man's will and God's sovereignty and all these type of things. If the scripture says in verse 4 that God's desire is that men be saved. All men. Yeah, all men. The question I'm asking is how does this relate to Adam and Eve? Because does God create Adam and Eve, kick them out the garden, and then from there it's basically leave people to their own devices? Because what you have here is you have the desire that God has for men to be saved and come to not just a, a basic sort of get the gospel out there, but for them to come to a knowledge of the truth. And this is what I'm saying. Whatever someone's view is, whatever your view is, just listen to what I'm going to present. You can disagree with it. But the question I'm asking, when I read this text, the fact that it says that God desires men to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth must mean the potential is there for them to do so. Yeah. In the text. No. Otherwise, it's not a true statement. So that's key. So now, if you look at the notes that I put together, I just said, why should we pray for people and focus on reaching out for the gospel? Why? Because it is God's will that we pray for people, because God's will is that men and women and boys and girls be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And that's key. So turn with me to 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 to 2. Because, again, in all of these things, there are little Greek words and little nuance. I'm just saying I'm reading it as it is, and we look at what it's saying. And it says, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So you have this this. I, this, this Key verse, it says God desires the world to be saved. It says that Jesus Christ gave himself as a propitiation, not just for our sin, but also for the sin of the world. Now, this is where we come back to what I said right at the beginning, that what we want to avoid is language of theology and look at language of the Bible. Because look at what verse 5 says, and there's some more things we're going to say around this. Look at verse 5. Because verse 5 is always quoted for the Catholics. So we don't like the Mary issue, of course. I'm, I'm all with the non-Mary issue. But I'm saying the verse gets taken out of its context because you talk to someone and what you say to them is there's only one mediator. And that's Jesus Christ. Mm. Boom. And it's great. You can use that. But the verse actually fits in with the context. Because look at what it says. God desires that all men be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. What does John 14, verse 6 say in context to verse 5 here? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Here in verse 4, God's desire is that men be saved. What is the avenue of salvation? How are they going to be saved? How is a godless, rebellious world going to be reconciled to a holy God? Verse 5 tells you, to the one mediator. The one avenue, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the context of the verse. Because God is pleading with the world. And how is the world going to come? Through what way? Through what avenue? The Lord Jesus Christ. 
Let's look at John chapter 3, verse 13 to 17. John 3, 13 to 17. And as I said, if you have buts to this, you can bring those next week with the ashtray. Okay. <laughs> so you can bring the buts next week. Because there will be buts, and it's fine. But I'm just presenting this. Oh, so it's a Massachusetts thing. Um, anyway, so John, John 3, 13 to 17 says, No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And the key verse here that I want to focus on here is verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And Jesus, of course, in the Gospels then later said that as he is lifted up, he will draw men to himself. That's very interesting with Charles Spurgeon. And I like Charles Spurgeon. I really do. Because he speaks the truth at times. Even as someone that there are certain parts of his theology I disagree with, he knows he can't reconcile certain things. Mm -hmm. His salvation story is very interesting. It was in a Methodist church and it was snowed in and this deacon stood up and spoke and Charles Spurgeon in his sort of autobiography said that basically what happened was this guy wasn't a great preacher, but he quoted from the book of Isaiah and he said to Spurgeon in the pew, he just looked at him and Spurgeon looked depressed because he's in church and, and the deacon just said to him, young man, look toward the Savior. That's all he said. And Spurgeon confessed Christ and came to faith. And when you see in John 3, verse 14, as the serpent's lifted up, and the picture, of course, goes back, which is very interesting theologically, because the picture goes back to, of course, the wilderness. But what's very interesting is normally you will say in theology that you don't use typology of something that's evil. Mm. And this is the only time where it's a bit of an awkward because now you've used a snake. Mm. But what is the picture? People are bitten by a snake. They are dying. God just says to Moses, make the brazen serpent, put it on a pole, put it up, and tell people to do what? To look. And when they look, they're going to be healed. Look at the context there, why John quotes this. That what you must do is look toward the Savior. And that's the picture that we have here. And that's the question that I'm not saying, I don't want to talk theology, I want to talk Bible. That's the picture that we see here. We are here to point people to Christ. They are dying. They are struggling. They are in rebellion. What is my response? My response is to not say that I'm the way, because I'm not, but I point them to Christ. When they look at Christ, they then receive healing. But when I say look at Christ, it's not just gay, it's not just glancing, it's looking. Looking for what? For salvation. That's what you're looking for. So we move on. To verse 6, before I get to my theological discussions on this issue. Because you see the context of verse 5, which is very important. It is the fact that we pray for people, the message is out there, and the one they must turn to is the mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 6, who gave himself a ransom for? No. Oh. To be testified in due time. Now, again, what I see here is I see all men... I see all, I see God's desire. Mm. And then verse 7, which says, for which I was appointed a preacher. A preacher of what? This message. An apostle. I'm speaking the truth in Christ and not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Because if there's any message that is far beyond the walls of Israel, it was Paul's message to go to the Gentiles. It's far, it is wide. So now, now what I want to share with you on this is this. So again, people have different views. And they have different views about the cross. That Jesus died for everyone. That Jesus only died for the elect. And all this talk, and it gets super in interesting, and people get super heated, and I just get bored. 
I get bored because again, what happens is theology is littered with philosophy and my own little mm. thinking and my own little things. I don't really care. Because one thing I never hear when we discuss the cross and we discuss what Christ has accomplished on the cross, I never hear the feasts, ever. All I hear is people talking about what this guy thought and that guy thought and what I think it is. I don't really care what people think it is. I'm asking, why do we never talk about Passover and never talk about atonement when it comes to the cross? Because we use the word atonement, but we don't we use it incorrectly, completely. Do you know that in the, in, the, in the King James Version, the word atonement is once in the Bible, in the New Testament? Only once. In the New King James, it's used four times because it's replaced at other times with reconciliation. In the NIV as well. And the only place it's used is Romans 5. Well, I have a lot of people that are very strong on the atonement in the New Testament. They never quote the Old Testament. So I find it very interesting. If people speak about the atonement and they talk about, no, it must be this, but they use New Testament language and the New Testament only uses it once. Because what is the reference point to the atonement is the Old Testament. The whole concept of the Old Testament of, of, of atonement leans and is drawn from the Old Testament. And that's what is so important. So there's a few things I want to share with you on this, which is vital. And there's a few verses we're going to look at. Because, again, we can talk and we're going to discuss this in a bit more detail next week when the questions come in about how this looks. I'm not here to basically flesh out everything. I'm here to, to, to leave you with some thoughts to go work on in this week to bring some questions. Because this is a very important aspect. Because you've got everyone quoting things that we don't know what we're talking about. We don't, because we don't look at the scriptures. So let's look at the Day of Atonement. Now, so I preached on this a few weeks ago, so if you haven't listened to the message, you can. But let's look at the Day of Atonement. So what you have on the Day of Atonement is a lot of interesting things. You've got the priest, and he must make a sacrifice for himself and for the nation. But what he must do is he must first make the sacrifice for himself, then take the blood <coughs> and go into the Holy of Holies and put the blood on the, the mercy seat or the, the covering of the ark. He comes back out and he makes a sacrifice then for the nation and takes that blood and puts it on the covering of the ark. Then comes out a third time and then prays the sins of the nation on the head of the scapegoat and the scapegoat is led out of the camp into the wilderness. So what must be done first before atonement is actually achieved? What must be done first? Blood must be shed. Yes. But what's key is the sacrifice outside must happen first before he gets to the, to the covering. So you actually don't have atonement until the blood is on the mercy seat. Now, we, we spoke about this in my sermon. I'm just going to... Go through that again. On the on the covering of the mercy seat, you have two angels that look down and they cover their faces. And in, in the ark, of course, you have the, the, the law, you've got uh, Aaron's staff that buds, and you've got the, the manna. Those angels look down for 359 days. They see the broken law. On the day of atonement, the blood is put on the covering, which means the angels don't see the broken law anymore. They see the blood that has been shed that is then able to make atonement which i'll explain in a little bit but what you have first is you have the the sacrifice outside you need the sacrifice to create the potential for atonement you don't have atonement when the sacrifice is made outside why because the blood has not been applied yet just by making the sacrifice outside you've got nothing all you have is the potential to then have atonement does that make sense? So when we look at the cross, everyone's very strong on the cross. Mm. What did the cross achieve? Because if you look at the, an atonement, you need the death of the, of the sacrifice. But nothing happens. Nothing is achieved just by the death of the sacrifice. What you need is you need that blood applied to then have any efficacy to bring about atonement. 
Same in, in Passover. You go back to Egypt. Let's, let's sacrifice the lamb. That's great. You can sacrifice the lamb, eat the bitter herbs, and eat your lamb. And guess what? You can sit back. You can have your clothes on. You can have your belt on, everything. And you can eat the Passover. And that destroyer will come and still kill your firstborn. Unless the blood is blind. Now, those are the types that I see in the Old Testament. Blood must be applied for something to take place. So when it speaks of Jesus Christ being the atonement or the reconciliation, he is both. He's the one that dies to make it possible. And he is the one that makes the reconciliation a reality. He's two things. So everyone just thinks because Jesus dies that that's enough. It's not enough. That just creates the platform and the potential for reconciliation. It's not the reconciliation itself. And so that's where people misunderstand this. They think, and again, it comes into all this conversation about you know, theology nonsense, where basically now Jesus dies, and that in itself then is effectual. No, it's not. And the types tell you it's not effectual. Why? Because in both processes of atonement, and Passover, unless the blood is applied, there is no reconciliation. Through faith. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. see, through faith. Unless you believe and apply it by faith, it has no efficacy for you. That's the key point. So it's not a passive thing. So the, the, the priest must take that blood, apply it for himself. He has faith in its efficacy on the mercy seat. He comes out the same efficacy for the nation. Yeah. And then the sin is prayed onto the, the scapegoat. To go. And that's what I see in the types. That's what the scriptures teach. Now, when, once we start talking theology, then everyone's got, but, but what about this? And that? I don't care about, but, but what, what, what about? I'm saying... That's what we see, which is the type, because Jesus Christ is our Passover and he is our atonement. And I'll share a few more things on that because I was struck hard by what the guy said this morning. And I've prepared this already, but what he said was spot on. And it's awkward. So in my notes, I said the priest makes the sacrifice first and he is then able to apply the blood. Christ's death was the sacrifice that then makes it possible. So that's why the word atonement cannot technically be used always in the New Testament in certain contexts. Because reconciliation is used, but reconciliation is the secondary process. The primary pro pro process of the death of Christ is that he is the atonement that makes it possible for reconciliation. So an angry God and a sinful people... Jesus Christ is the propitiation. He satisfies God's demands. But that satisfaction does not necessarily mean reconciliation. It just means satisfaction. It's two different things. God is satisfied. But now, how do I then enter in? Let's look at the priest picture. So I'm going to share this priest picture. The priest has to make the sacrifice outside the tabernacle to enter the Holy of Holies. He cannot enter the Holy of Holies without the blood. Makes sense. So the sacrifice makes it possible to then now be reconciled. So Jesus Christ, what is so beautiful as, as, as God in the flesh, is both the sacrifice that makes it possible and the one that is reconciled with. Because he is the one that brings who together. So he's the one that dies. His blood is good. Yes. But so your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ is what then reconciles you to God, which is the second process and not just the primary process. And that's why it's more complex. Now, you don't know this at the beginning, of course, of your, your spiritual journey. You don't know this. But now looking back, we see this. But the problem is that people have built theology around certain concepts and completely left out the feasts. In our whole approach to everything. Oh, this is the gospel. What yeah. gospel? The gospel of what? The gospel without the feasts. The gospel without the sacrifices are the main sacrifices that speak of the work of Christ. And it's completely misapplied. It's not the gospel. It is your concept of the gospel. And God is gracious in his mercy to still save, even if it is come when God can yeah. use a donkey, can use someone doesn't know. 
But I'm just I'm just drawing this because the whole principle where people are saying now, and whatever your view is on this, that some suddenly no, you can't believe. You, no, that 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 is a work in itself to believe. Totally contradicts the feasts. Hmm. Because the whole point is that God is gracious to his people, not so? He is. But the blood must still be applied for that to become effica yeah. efficacious. So the point is that, again, we can have this conversation of how all these things work. I'm 100% for that. But please don't undermine the feasts in this conversation. Because then what we're doing is we're allowing philosophy and extra biblical writings to dictate to us what the scriptures teach. Because what I see in the scriptures is there must be an application of the blood on the mercy seat. Mm. And that must take place. And unless that takes place, there is no reconciliation. Let's look at some passages. Romans chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 9 to 11. And, and why I use this? Because, you know, we all, you know, you feel under pressure. You feel under pressure. You must be strong. Okay, so you got this whole people that break down the sort of any any evangelist that wants to reach out and say people must you know apply or put their faith and trust in Jesus, and it becomes a big issue, as if the person's just like crazy and the person's just um, you know theologically not sound. And I'm saying really, because I'm going to look at some passages to ask the question of how this works. Now, of course, all of these things are nuanced. I'm not saying that there are no, no, no nuances, but what I'm just saying is that if you have these systems that start creating thoughts on either side of the discussion on the atonement, and it's not biblical language, I become very concerned. Because I'm super concerned of the way that certain things are used and certain words are used and manipulated to fit a certain system that actually is not the biblical way and usage. So let's look at uh, Romans 5, 9 to 11 and what it says. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. What language is that? So if I look at language, what language is that? That language is Passover language, not so. The blood is applied to the doorpost. What am I saved from? The destroyer. Do you see the language of Passover there? Mm -hmm. It's not the language of atonement. This is Passover language. Mm -hmm. That the blood is, I'm justified to the blood and therefore saved from wrath to come. It's beautiful. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by what? Mm -hmm. This is a big thought. This is what if someone shared with me this morning and I'm just like, what? Mm -hmm. Sounds like a heretic. He basically made the statement by saying that you're not saved by the death of Jesus. That doesn't save you. And he was like, oh. Because here the text is saying you're not saved by his death. You're reconciled by his death. But what saves you is his life. Because what is it that saves? What is the gospel we share? We don't just share the death of Jesus on the cross. But you share something else that is the most important part, which is the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And what saves you is the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Romans 10, 9 says, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. So what is key is the gospel is empty without the resurrection. There's no gospel without the resurrection. There's no power without the resurrection. The resurrection was the confirmation of what happened on the cross, but you need the power of the resurrection. But that's, again, Awkward for some. Because if we drive home this picture of Jesus coming and, and, and purchasing only a certain group and not others, how does the resurrection fit into that? Because there's more to the purchase than just his death. Mm -hmm. It is his resurrection, his life, because it's life that he gives. I'll give you some passages on that. And verse 11 says, not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. What makes reconciliation possible? Um, King James will say atonement. What makes it possible? The death of Jesus Christ makes it possible. So this is the picture. This is the best picture you have. 
In the Old Testament on Mount Sinai, when Moses went up, received the law, what was it like? It was thunderings, there were clouds, it was darkness, it was scary. Mm -hmm. okay. That's the picture. Receive the law, fear and trembling. The tabernacle becomes a haven for, for God to meet with his people, but the picture that they have is of scary. Touch the mountain, you die. What did Moses have to do first before he went up on the mountain? He made a sacrifice before he could go up. So what gave him access to the mountain was that. So the picture you have is what the death of Jesus Christ accomplished was to turn the wrath of God away because he satisfies the demands. So on the cross, God pours out his wrath on the Lord Jesus Christ and satisfies the demand so that the clouds over Mount Sinai can become clear blue sky, which shows that you still have to climb the mountain, but there's access now. Because God said to Moses, "Don't you can't bring these, you only bring certain people, and there must be a sacrifice before you can come. So they touch the mountain and die. There was no access. How do I know this? What is the Day of Atonement telling us? Is there access to the Holy of Holies? No. Why? Because God's wrath needs to be satisfied first. Every day or every atonement, this God's demands were met through the sacrifice, and therefore the priest could come. But unless the demands are met, you cannot come. What happened when Jesus Christ died on the cross? What happened to the temple curtain? It's a in two. Why? There's access now. Wrath has been satisfied to create the opportunity or possibility or Ability to now come before the throne of grace. But you have to come before the throne of grace. But the access has been made possible. It wasn't made possible previously. Because that's why the priest was there. That's why Israel was there. Because Israel was the connection that the Gentiles would have had to God in that sense. So verse 11 says, not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now receive the reconciliation. And reconciliation is so important because reconciliation is the fact that in Jesus Christ, we are reconciled to God. We are brought close. We are in an intimate relationship because that wrath has been satisfied. It's been dealt with. The barrier has been taken away in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the gospel. Now, again, we, we must deal with the fact that people sin and people are in rebellion. But as I said in the beginning, let's deal with the first two commandments first. They have, um, they're not worshiping God and they worship idols. That's the key thing. But the thing, this whole point, the whole time of God's angry still. Yeah, he's angry at sin, 100%. But the pathway has been open for people to be reconciled to God. To constantly drive home this angry God picture. Is not the New Testament. Now, this is not saying that everyone can just do whatever they want and God says it's fine. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that the, the pathway is open, but the pathway is narrow. And who is the path according to the fifth verse of 1 Timothy 2? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. His death and resurrection has made it possible for man to be reconciled back to God. That's the gospel message. And so the picture we, Last bit again. So the, the, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ makes it possible for man to be reconciled back to God. Because that's what he's he accomplished that. But it doesn't mean it's automatic. No. It's the potential of reconciliation. Because that's the, 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 that's the picture of the feast. It's the blood must be applied. If the priest did not apply the blood, he was struck down dead and wasn't accepted. It is about the possibility or the potential of reconciliation. It doesn't necessarily mean that there will be definite reconciliation. It's just the passage is cleared open for reconciliation to take possible, to be made possible. And, and we'll deal with that on Sunday in 2 Corinthians 5. We implore you be reconciled to God. It's the call. Mm -hmm. And I can say this, and I say this with absolute assurance yeah. as someone that as to always feel like you have to be strong and have to, it's a call to people be reconciled to God. Not a call that you're all just going to die and turn or burn. 
Because that's the that's the picture that people think that it was, it was constantly that picture. Now, yes, the reality, of course, has elements to that. But we're looking now at the reality of the gospel call and what we see in First Timothy chapter two, which is saying to a lost world and a rebellious world, be reconciled to God in and through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at First Corinthians one twenty one. First Corinthians one twenty one. Therefore, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. Because that's what the pagans did. That's what Romans 1 says. They became so clever, they rejected the creator and worshipped the creation. It pleased God to the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. To the preaching of the message those who will be saved are those who believe. It's quite interesting in verse 24. I looked at the, the Greek there as well because it says, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, many people say, who's the ones that are called? Actually, the Greek word for called there is, is basically used for the saved. What it's used for. It's not actually God's call. It's just saying those saved, both Jew and Gentile. That's the way it's used. So you see here in verse, verse 21 that the key here is the message is preached and those who believe are then saved. Hmm. And as I said, that's the same. I reiterate John 3, yeah. 13 to 17 as well. But the whole point is for God to love the world that he gave only begotten son and Christ did not come into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved so again the issue is for us as Christians in the message we share sin is very serious and what we always have to remind people of is that grace is free but it's not cheap it's a difference and then for the people of God for those who are in Christ we have a responsibility to live godly lives, 100%. And we must live for God's honor and glory. And, and those whom God loves, he chastises. So he's serious with us. But the question is, what is the gospel call to a lost world? And for us to, to, to expect them to live according to our standards first makes no sense logically. We don't go out to the world and give them standards. We go out to the world and share a message that God is holy and righteous and they are separated from him. They are. But they can be reconciled because he has made a way for them to be reconciled in and through our Lord Jesus Christ. So when we go back to 1 Timothy chapter 2. The key here to what he, he shares with Timothy is he's basically making the blanket statement for the work of Christ and how that applies to everybody and what that looks like. And that's what you'll see here in verse 4, 5, and 6. Now, again, there are nuances to that. 100% there are nuances about why some people believe and others don't. And I think there's a lot of discussion on that. But what we need to do to, before we get to that secondary conversation, the primary conversation is, what does the Old Testament teach on the cross? Because I think it, it completely sidesteps the real issues by us talking about, um, you know, going into the Gospels and using, so I hear constantly these verses where Jesus came to die for his sheep. He did, of course. But in no context ever is the Christian church called sheep. Never. Israel is called sheep. You see the same, of course, in the parable of um, the, the treasure in the field. Mm. The man gives up everything to buy the, the treasure. But for him to do that, he buys the field because the treasure is Israel. So a lot of times Jesus Christ speaks about his death being very applicable to Israel as a remnant and those who, who are in Israel who 
who believe. He dies for them. There's a, there's a clear picture of that. And then what happens is people impose that onto the New Testament church, and it just becomes a mess. Yeah. I lay my life down for my sheep, and so the sheep must be believers. Yeah, it is, 100%, in the context of the time, which were Jews. Mm -hmm. So you have to then be consistent because the key here is let's define the cross. Let's define the word atonement. And on Sunday, I'm going to deal with reconciliation and substitution because it's, it's too big for my brain to deal with. My brain's going to explode. I get it. And you might feel your brain's going to explode. But what I'm just trying to say is before we get to being dogmatic because what well, someone else told me something, first know what we're talking about when it comes to the cross. Because we go out and we share the most powerful, important message in the world, and people don't even know what the message is. We just make assumptions of what we think the message is because someone else has told us. And that's why the Christian church needs to be, maybe take a bit more time in actually studying the Bible first before they start getting super gutsy out there. Yeah. Because otherwise we can cause more damage by preaching a message that's actually not biblical. So let's look at the cross. Let's look at the feast, what Jesus Christ came to do. And there's so much more to it why the resurrection is important, and the fact that Jesus Christ paid a price, 100%, because he redeemed us, and that whole principle is there. But also what is important in some other aspects is that salvation is not complete yet. Because unless we're in heaven, our salvation is not fully complete. Because there's an aspect to salvation that is still to come, which is when we are with the Lord. So there's a lot of things to this that we have to sort of think about. And work through and that's why these these seven verses to me are very, very important that's why i wanted to just present that to you think about it. we can have one or two questions now but look at it first formulate an argument to say well okay bring and you can bring those nuances to us next week and we can discuss that but as i said i just look at what the text is saying you look at the feast you look at the types you look at the principle of atonement and redemption and reconciliation. And I see I see a very, very important picture. Because I also highlight the fact that not many people highlight the issue of Jesus Christ being the scapegoat as well. And the scapegoat never mm. dies. Mm. So death to the scapegoat. So Jesus Christ's work is not just his death, but it's also what he did in his life. Mm. Pre cross and post cross. So when John the Baptist said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, he wasn't talking about the Passover lamb. He was talking about the scapegoat. Wow. Jesus Christ is a sin bearer. He carries our burdens for humanity. He carried those burdens. And then we get all these conversations about all these type of things. Now, and, and again, not understanding what John was saying. He wasn't talking about Passover. Because the Passover lamb never took away sin. If you look at Passover, where in Passover does it deal with sin at all? It's not about sin. It's about redemption. Not so. It's about God redeeming his people, not saving them from a salvation spiritual perspective. There's nothing spiritual about Passover. What there is is about God's intervention to redeem. And Jesus Christ came into the world to redeem. There's a strong aspect to that. So, yes, salvation in a general sense is connected. But when you look at Passover... Not about sin. So when it says, behold the Lamb of God, John 1, who takes away the sins of the world, he's not referring to Passover, but he's referring to the atoning sacrifice and the, the um, scapegoat in particular, that he will carry the sins. It's quite interesting as well. When did, where did Jesus Christ go after he was with John the Baptist? For 40 days and 40 nights. Where does the scapegoat go? Yes. And what did Jesus Christ deal with in the wilderness? He dealt with temptation, he dealt with sin. So again, I'm not saying I know everything here, or I'm super clever. I'm just no. saying that we must just rein ourselves yeah. in, humble ourselves, and start looking at what the Bible actually says. Because I'm very challenged by Christian language. I'm very challenged by stuff I'm hearing in the church and what we have been saying and what I've been saying for many, many years. And as I'm growing and, and, and working through books of the Bible and looking at words, I'm very challenged by things I pray about, things I think about, words I use flippantly, not knowing actually what they mean. And I want us to be far more uh, sort of... Uh, Humble in the way we use yeah. words, but also far more conscious in what we're actually saying. Because sometimes we could say something that sounds very biblical, but it's actually not. 
because we haven't studied, we haven't understood what it means because of our um, Occidental way of thinking, which is always this Greekified philosophical Plato, Aristotle yeah. way of approaching yeah. the scriptures and not actually using the key that God gives us to unlock certain things. Okay. Are there any concluding thoughts or questions? Mm. I was a bit confused about your saying, praying for the Roman authority. You wrong with that? You didn't find it was wrong. Did I say there's anything wrong with it? Yeah. No, no, it's nothing wrong with it. It's no. good. Okay. But it's, it's, it's what you're praying for, Keith. Because many people are praying for those in authority that they be, that they they become Christians. Mm -hmm. That's not what the, the prayer is for in verse two. Right. So praying for salvation is verse one. But some people pray specifically for the government. We need Christians in government, and we need the yeah. Christians to, to get in there. That's mm -hmm. not what the, sorry? It'd be a great thing, wouldn't it? But that's not what the Bible speaks about. The Bible never calls on Caesar to now repent. We need a new mm -hmm. because it, all that the Bible speaks about is the only time that things will be good from a government perspective is when Jesus Christ returns. Mm -hmm. So the Christian's responsibility is not to pray Christians into government. That is a very modern thing. You will not find that in the New Testament. The What's happened is it's become this momentum we have now because we want to create a Christian utopia. So because of a faulty theology, and especially because of a, an amillennial approach, which means we're living mm. in the kingdom now, we're basically praying for Christians to be, our, our head teachers must all be Christian, and we must get a Christian prime yeah. minister, and then we can create this Christian utopia, which, as I said, you can have that, but I don't read it in scripture. I don't see it in the New Testament. That, that is what Paul prays for. And that's why you pray for those in authority that they will do what is right, carry the sword properly, and do their job. As I wrote in my devotional, which is basically just put structures in place that we can live and do our thing and that they can just make sure that we're safe. That's their job. Their job is not to tell me what to do with my family. Their job is not to tell me what to do with my health. And their job is not to tell me. Um, how to live my life. That's not the, that's not the government's responsibility. They have to keep structures in place. You can see this with regards to like Kate Forbes. She's yeah. with her faith. But everything she's saying, she's saying like, it might be what I personally feel, but how, what I would do in government's different. So you can see how it never worked. No, 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 it can't be. No, it can't no. Be. And it's actually, it could be a bad reflection. I mean, you know, you yeah. actually, well, I was going to mention about Because, because that means that she's prepared to compromise all the time. Well, and, and not just that, though. Um, and it's like, I mean, I put, I, my person, it's my personal view, okay, I actually think these nationalist parties are demonic. So it's like, but that's not to say that you can't have a Christian that's in the head of, the, head of it. No. Just a bad it. reflection it is. Could it be a bad reflection anyway? So, you know, my personal view is I actually think it would be the worst thing for her. Yeah, I think it would be. I How can you be spiritually mature and be in that position where exactly. you have to lie? Exactly. Because a politician, of course, when they open their mouth, yeah. it's lies. So they, they function on lies. So as a Christian, how do you actually tell the truth? This place is burning down from the inside, but I can't tell you. So again, you, you're going to have to compromise and it will affect your faith and it become a very difficult process. Look at what happened to Tim Farron. He couldn't, he couldn't yeah. function. He couldn't function no. with his conscience, could he? So yeah. Um, you know, not the conservative party, but is nowhere near being like... Any anything else there from the Zoom folks? Yeah. No, thank you. Oh, brilliant! Thank you very much. Well, we'll see you see you next week. So bring some questions. All right, fantastic. We're going to close in prayer. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for what you have declared to us today, and we pray that you'll help us to to look at other verses and that we will be able to really understand the fullness of the cross. Thank you, Lord, for us. It's a great blessing. Thank you, Lord, also that for the world and those we share the gospel with, they don't have to understand every single nuance. We are understanding that because that enriches our walk with you. But help us to just share plain gospel, Lord, mm. with those outside the walls of the church. So we can just share with them the wonderful reality and truth that man can be reconciled to God in and through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, Father, we thank you for your, your, your plan and purpose. And we just pray that you'll continue to work in our hearts and lives. In your wonderful name we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. 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 Thank you. Have a wonderful day. God bless. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.